Blessings and greetings to all. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome all of us to this continued seminar on Daniel and Revelation. Just again, welcome. I say welcome. Pastor Smith has been doing a really good job. And quite a lot of issues were quite nebulous for me as a person. And so far, a lot of things have been clearing up. And I want to give Pastor Smith plenty of kudos for clearing up things for me. And I'm sure he's clearing up a lot of things for all of us. And I'd like all of us to listen carefully to what Pastor Smith has to say. Welcome, welcome, I say welcome. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you how you have been with us through the day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the way that you are going to move this evening. I pray, Heavenly Father, as your word go forth, that it may touch heart of men and women across this platform. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they may join closer to you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we listen, dear God, that we would understand your word. Give us wisdom. Help us, dear Lord, that we may be able to share your word after hearing it this evening. Be with the speaker, Heavenly Father. Let him proclaim your word, Heavenly Father, in clarity. Be with each person, dear Lord, as they listen for Christ's sake. Amen. Good night to our viewing friends once again. We do hope that you had a wonderful day and last night you would have enjoyed yourself and you're ready to listen to God's will again. And so we say to you, those of you who are viewing us for the first time, welcome to Jesus is the Answer Prophecy Panorama. 
where we present to you the Word of God for the end of time. Tonight, we are going to be looking at the topic, Back to the Future. Uh, we want to know the future. There are so many people today who are asking what will happen tomorrow, what will happen next year. But tonight, we are going to unravel it, Back to the Future. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight again, as we delve into your words, I pray that your Holy Spirit will open our the heart of our understanding. May you open our eyes to, reveal, to see your words so that as we see your words, we will hear, we'll accept, and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we, want to, we want to just view our theme text uh, taken from Matthew 28 and verse 20. Matthew 28 and verse 20, a text that many of us are familiar with teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Uh, back to the future. While the, second, while the second chapter of Daniel is part of the historical section of the book, it contains one of the most amazing prophecies. The prophecy found in this, this chapter is uh, the foundation upon which all the prophecies of the book of Daniel are built. In order to comprehend uh, the prophecies of Daniel, the principle is repetition. The principle of repetition must be understood if we are going to really unravel what is there for us. Daniel 2 begins uh, with uh, the Babylonian Empire and culminates in the return of Jesus Christ. All of the prophecies in Daniel cover the same basic outline. However, each subsequent prof prophecy adds significant details that were not included in the initial one. In other words, the rest of the prophecies expand what is initially covered in a broader sweep in Daniel 2. The focal point of each expansion is always on the end time. Tonight, we are going to look at a king's amazing dream that gives startling evidence of the unseen hand of God guiding history to one incredible event. Many of us are looking for something better. History is replete with names of individuals who have dreamt of setting up world empires. Caesar, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, Stalin, Mussolini, Hitler, and Hirohito, they have all been obsessed with this desire, but they have all been doomed to disappointment. They have all failed because Bible prophecy clearly states uh, that they will not adhere to one another. In the second chapter of Daniel, we find a brief and fascinating history of a world event right down to the end of time. In the narratives, the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the ruler of the first world empire known as the Babylonian Empire, Babylon was the greatest, richest, and most influential of all the empires in the then known world. In the second year of his reign, King Nebuchadnezzar went to bed thinking about his accomplishments and his next conquest. That night, God gave him a, a peek into the future. Nebuchadnezzar was so troubled by the dream because he knew that it had implications for his kingdom, but he could not remember what he dreamt. The Babylonians placed great importance on dreams, and, and the king wanted to know the dream and its interpretation. He went for the astrologers, uh, the magicians, and uh, the wise men seeking answers to his dreams. He went to, to seek answers from those who supposedly know the future. But to his disappointment, these men were just imposters. Daniel 2 and verse 3 says, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the interpretation. 
they could not help him. The magicians and, uh, and uh, the wise men that they placed so much confidence in could not help him. They said, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. There are many people today who make the same mistake that Nebuchadnezzar made. They attempt uh, to, keep, to peep into the future. So they resort to astrology and fortune tellers when they should be consulting with the word of God. Daniel 2, 12 states, For this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. He dispatched the chief of the, of the king's guard to gather all the wise men of Babylon for the execution. Unfortunately, there were some young Hebrews, Hebrew captives in Babylon. Daniel and his companions, and they were considered to be among the wise men. Daniel, uh, Daniel and, his, and his companions, they did not have the privilege to go before the king. But in, in spite of that, they were among those that were to be persecuted, executed. Daniel asks for time to consult uh, his God regarding the king's matter. The time was granted, and, and after Daniel and his, and his three companions had prayed earnestly to the Lord, the dream was revealed to them that very night. Daniel was ushered into the presence of King Nebuchadnezzar. The king asks uh, in a cynical way in verse 26, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? You see, you see Nebuchadnezzar could have only uh, responded in that way to Daniel because his trusted men could not have done it. His God could not have done it. Uh, but, but thank God that Daniel stood up and when Daniel stood up, it wasn't about him. Here was an opportunity for Daniel to claim the glory for himself. But being a true servant of God, he did not do so. Daniel did not take the credit for himself. He did not take the credit for what he did not earn. He knew that only God could reveal the future. And so in verse 28, he says, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. Daniel says, It's not about me. I cannot tell you the dream or the interpretation. But I know a God in heaven. My God in heaven can reveal secrets and he can reveal dreams to you. And he has made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will be in the latter days. I want you to understand here, and um, Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, God has revealed to you what will happen in the latter days. Notice that Daniel said that God was revealing something that pertained to the latter days. He was making reference to Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. For it says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Daniel unfolded the king's dream, a dream that outlined over 2,600 years of the history of the world. In verse 31, we read, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. Daniel then described in details the awesome scene of the giant image that Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. The king immediately recognized the forgotten dream. In verse, verses 32 and 33, it says, This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thigh of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. The king was indeed amazed. Nebuchadnezzar's cynicism was gone. He now listened intently as Daniel told him the dream. 
As Daniel told him more, the king was, uh, was amazed and he started listening more. But there is one more thing. As the story unfolded, in verse 34 we read, You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Now the king remembered the dream. More than ever, he wanted to know what the dream meant. In verse 37 and 38, Daniel says, You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You are the head of gold. Gold was a fitting symbol of the beauty and wealth of the Babylonian empire. The glorious wall capital was laid out in per perfect square. 60 miles around the walls, gold was lavishly used to embellish the building of Babylon. The Euphrates River ran through the city, flanked on each side by gleaming gates. There was luxuriant pleasure grounds, royal palaces, and magnificent dwellings. There were the hanging gardens, one of the seven wonders of the world. But God, in, in verse 39, he said, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Nebuchadnezzar began, began to listen intently because he wants to know what this meant. Just as God has predicted to Nebuchadnezzar in this marvelous dream, the Babylonian Empire finally fell to the second world power called the Persian Empire. On October 13, 539 B.C., the golden kingdom of Babylon came to an inglorious end. God had prophesied exactly by whom and how the city would be taken. God, in his good love and mercy, he was extending mercy to, uh, to the king of Babylon. But he did not heed it at that time, nearly 200 years before the fall of Babylon. God, through the prophet Isaiah, said, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations before him, and loose the arm, armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. When the Medes and Persians laid siege to Babylon, they were scoffed at by the Babylonians. Uh, they threw tons of food over their walls to show the Persians they could withstand a siege for any period of time. However, under Cyrus the Great, the Medes and Persians finally got through into the city of Babylon, and it fell. You see, my friends, one night, one night, one, one night, they messed up. They left the gates open. They were drinking and having their party, and uh, they were able to divert some of the water so that they could have gotten into the city. Babylon became history. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth. This prediction of the bronze belly and thighs was filled with the brilliant young Alexander the Great, defeated Darius III of Persia in the Battle of Abella in 331 BC. This third kingdom of brass symbolized the Grecian Empire led by Alexander the Great in conquest of the world. Much of the armor worn by the Greek infamy was made of brass. In five short years, Alexander swept on to victory. The Greek historian Arian says, I am persuaded there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. My friends, Historians are looking back and seeing now the, the, uh, the invisible hand of God leading through history. Just seven years later, Alexander died in a, in a drunken debauch. Like a meteor in the night, 
the light suddenly went out. Alexander thought he would have conquered the world, but he failed because God gave him a time. God is giving all of us a time. The fourth universal kingdom is, is described in verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, and uh, the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. So, the fourth kingdom, my friends, Rome was to be strong. It was to be as strong as iron, symbolized by the iron legs in the image. Her Caesars called themselves gods and, and demanded the worship and obedience of all men. Rome began to rule the world. During this empire, Jesus was born. The famous historian Edward Gibbons says, the image of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. The history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. This iron monarchy of Rome under the mighty Caesars soon conquered the world. The course of history and, uh, had reached the legs of iron when Jesus was born. We read in Luke 2 and verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the reason that Joseph and Mary went to the town of Bethlehem where Jesus was born. The, Roman ruled, the Romans ruled the world with great power until they began living in luxury, drunkenness, and licentiousness. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 41 we read, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. The Roman Empire lost its character and strength and was broken up into ten divisions by the invasions of the barbarian tribes from the north. I want to let you know, my friends, uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these barbarians came in and they did what God had prophesied of them to do. So these ten tribes are listed as follows uh, by most historians. Alemanni, the Germans, Franks, the French, Anglo-Saxons, English, the Visigoths, Spanish, Burgundians, Swiss, Lombards, Italians, the Suave, Portuguese, the Vandals, they're extinct, Hurley, they are extinct, Ostrogoths, they are extinct. God said they will never be united. He said that if they mingle themselves with the seeds of men, in other words, intermarry royalty, that will not work either. They will not stay together. And we, uh, we are told in history uh, that they tried uh, to, uh, to, to cleave to one another by intermarrying, but it did not work. The feet and toes uh, in the image were of iron and clay, and God had predicted that the kingdoms symbolized by the ten toes will never be united. Today, my friends, as you, as you, you are aware, uh, that in 2016, uh, when Britain decided to sign its treaty to get out of the Union, it created even more uncertainty in the European, European Union. We read in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 43, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men. They shall not cleave to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. Notice the seven words that have stopped every aspiring world leader up to the present time. They shall not cleave to one another. In an effort to unite Europe, the royal family is intermarried. Uh, therefore, the royal families in Europe are related. 
Many attempts were made to reunite the nations of Europe. Among those leaders are Charlemagne I, who tried to reunite the divisions of the Roman Empire. He was defeated. Next, Charles V tried, he was defeated. Louis XIV tried, he was defeated. Napoleon tried, he was defeated. Kaiser Wilhelm tried, he was defeated. Adolf Hitler tried, he was defeated. I, I wrote Hito, tried, he was defeated. God says, they will not cleave to one another. And God will not allow any dictator to successfully unite these nations of Europe. In Daniel 2.21 it says, And he changes the times and the season. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Again, the elements of nature were responsible for defeat. Such a simple thing as snowflakes helped defeat Hitler's army in Russia. Adolf Hitler had de defied God and now he was reaping the whirlwind. He had issued a proclamation in March of 1941 as follows. To my people, we do not need anything from God. Uh, we do not ask him for anything except that he may let us alone. We want to fight our own war with our, our own guns without God. Godless communism or any other power in this planet is doomed uh, to the same fate. Remember, God is still on his throne. Hitler knew the prophecies of Daniel. A woman who had nursed Hitler in a time of illness says that Hitler will read the second chapter of Daniel. And when he will come to the place where it says, they will not adhere to one another. He will leap from his bed, ranting and raging, shouting at the top of his lungs. I will win. I will win. If Hitler were alive today, he might return to the tomb of Napoleon where he scoffed. So, and about all, the, all he could say would be, Napoleon, move over. However, in spite of the atom bomb, it did not take long for Stalin to reveal that he also had aspirations to world domination. Communism had begun the same program of world conquest. Communism took the Baltic states, Poland, Romania, Albania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, part of Korea, and Indochina. Gained by leaps and bounds in India. And last but not least, there is China, a mighty stronghold of communism. But Stalin died. He has now lost even all the glorious memories and worshipful adoration given him by the multitudes of Russia. God says that the old Roman Empire or the Western Europe can never be welded together again. The seven mighty words of scripture, they will not adhere to one another, for dooms any attempts to conquer the world. God revealed to Daniel in the prophecy of Daniel 2 that while no man who aspired to be a universal ruler could succeed, eventually all the nations will finally be reunited under the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. The prophecy says in Daniel 2 and verse 24, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. My friends, I, I hear you say, amen, my friends, because he says, and the kingdom shall not be left to any other people. It shall, be, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Daniel reveals uh, that the great rock uh, that broke the image in pieces represents Jesus Christ, the rock of ages. Leland Stowe says, Humanity has been given a suspended sentence, but its days of grace are fearfully short. 
while time remains, uh, 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 yes, Jesus is saying to us, dear friends, time is short. Jesus Christ is coming very soon from heaven to rule all nations under one banner. He is coming as King of kings and Lord of lords to set up a kingdom, a kingdom of eternal peace and glory. All the world will then be united under the banner of love. What a wonderful day that will be. What a glorious moment it will be. We are living today down in the toes of the prophetic image. History has run its course. Thomas He Moray of the Atomic Energy Commission says, For all we know, it may be the incomprehensible and inscrutable will of God to make us 20th century closing time for the human race. And we are now in the 21st century. Yes, we are in the closing time of the Earth's history. Actually, we are living down in the toenail of the image. When you have looked at man over uh, from head to toe, you have gone as far as you can go. So the history of the world has gone about as far as it can go. The next glorious drama will be Christ and his coming. The Bible predicts that we are living in the day of our Lord's return. Thoughtful men everywhere and going convinced that the return of Christ is imminent. Men have tried to unite the nations. They have tried to make peace. But, uh, but puny men cannot solve the problems of our world. Christ's coming is the answer to our needs. Uh, truly, he is coming soon. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Are you ready for him to come? The new millennium had dawned. Millions of people are developing an interest in prophecy. They are asking, what on earth will happen next? Uh, they wonder, where in the world are we heading? Uh, they are fascinated with the future. They are curious about the uncertainty of the world and the world events unfolding before our very eyes. They are desperately looking for answers. According to recent Newsweek magazine poll, 40% of all Americans, that is about 120 million people in the United States alone, believe the world will end in a dramatic cataclysmic battle called Armageddon between Jesus and the Antichrist. Friends, for the last 30 years, interest in the future had been dramatically growing. In, uh, the, in, in the 1970s, the best-selling book of the decade was Hall Lindsay's The Late Great Planet Earth, with 28 million copies sold by 1990. More recently, a series of novels titled Left Behind uh, by Tim Leahy and Jerry Jenkins, including two published in 1999, have sold 9 million copies. These novels use the Book of Revelation as their base. Movie producers have jumped on board this prophetic end-time train roaring in the future. The smash hit film, the Omega Code got 2.4 million in its opening weekend. The last days have become popular entertainment. Over 239 websites are multiplying end time scenarios. The November 1, 1999 edition of Newsweek magazine front cover shouted the words, prophecy, what the Bible says about the end of the world. It is not only Christians who are concerned about the end of the world. It is not only Christians who are concerned about end time events. Jews believe that the world will be ushered into a final sequence of events which will ultimately liberate Israel from bondage of its oppressors. They are convinced that the Messiah will come in glory to defeat all their foes and establish the kingdom of God with Jerusalem at the center of the new kingdom. The Muslims 
also are looking for an apocalyptic end of the world. They believe the battle of Armageddon will soon take place, followed by the last conflict. In their view, Jesus and Imam, one of Muhammad's descendants, will fight against the Antichrist. Bernard McGinn, a specialist in the University of Chicago Divinity School, says, over the past 30 years, more scholarship has been devoted to apocalypticism, last day events, than in the last 300 years. The tempo is picking up. Interest in the future is at an all-time high. People are desperate for answers. They are anxious for some word about the future. Unfortunately, millions are searching in all the wrong places. Millions are turning to so-called psychics to discover answers to their questions regarding the future. So, my friends, I say to us, are you ready for Jesus to come? Jesus is the answer. Do you want to know the future? Do you want to be prepared for the future? Nebuchadnezzar, he, wa he wanted to know the future because for him it was uncertain. Even though he was, he was leading the world at that time, there was something about him uh, that yearned for more. Today, my friends, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter your status in life. There's something still missing in your, in your life if Jesus is not the center of your life. So tonight, my friends, you were saying, you want to be ready for Jesus to come? You want to see Jesus when he comes. You want to be prepared for the future. When Jesus will put in his appearance, when he shall set up his kingdom, you want to be ready. You want to be in that kingdom. Why don't you pray with me tonight? Heavenly Father, tonight, Lord, you have revealed yourself to us again. You have promised us, Lord, that after all this, all the plagues, all, all the challenges and difficulties that confront us in life, uh, that you will set up your kingdom. We now see, Lord, that we are living in the end of time. The signs of the times are telling us that your coming is near. And tonight, Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We ask, Lord, that you come into our hearts and prepare our lives. There are those, Lord, who may be asking questions about the future. There may be those who are uncertain about the future. But I pray tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will reveal to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, that you are the answer to all of life's questions and that you love us. And because you love us so much and send your son to die on Calvary's cross for us, you are coming for us. You're coming for people who are ready. I pray, Lord, that each one of us tonight uh, at the hearing of my voice and as they bow their heads and close their eyes, that they will say within their hearts, Lord, come into my life and save me. I want to be ready. I love you, Jesus. I know you love me. Save me in your eternal kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow night, see you tomorrow night when we will be looking at the topic feeling hot, hot, hot. See you tomorrow night. May God bless you and enjoy the rest of the evening.